Thank you so much. Um, uh, before um, I get started, um, I just wanted to acknowledge that um, this uh, work, which I was doing at UC Davis, that is on the unceded territory of the Putwin uh, people. Um, uh, on which I was sort of a long-term visitor slash somewhat temporary settler. So uh, mindful of the you know legacy of, of violence there um, and grateful to them for that land um, and opportunity. Um, and yeah, without further ado, um, you know, I am actually interested in sensory experiences because I am myself autistic and had a lot of really unpleasant sensory experiences uh, when I was younger. It's it's actually kind of neat for me to be here at an ACT um, uh, event um, because uh, ACT was really kind of my first um, sort of exposure to um, autism research back in the day. And now here I am um, as somebody who researches autism here to share some of my research. It's all kind of neat. Um, <laughs> And yeah, um, you know, the sensory experiences that I had growing up, they were very impactful. You know, they affected my mental health, my ability to participate in things. Um, and so I am very interested in trying to better understand these sort of experiences because um, looking back now, you know, now I have a much better understanding of the experiences. I have a much better idea of what's going on when I have the experiences. But back then, you know, I could convey that I was in distress. I can convey a bit about the experience, but there was a lot that I was missing that I didn't understand about my own experiences, let alone, you know, being able to uh, explain that to other people and advocate for the support that I needed. So a lot of people were perceiving these sorts of things as like behavior issues and stuff like that. Um, as you might expect. So that sort of leads to the question, you know, what might underlie a lot of these sensory differences? And I actually think it's really revealing here to think about what is not different um, between um, autistic and non-autistic people. So if you take people into like really controlled laboratory environments, you know, dark rooms and you give them, you know, this very specific task, like, you know, what is the tiniest difference between two sensory stimuli that you can detect or what is the very subtlest sensory stimulus that you can detect? Like, for example, you know, this um, graph here that is showing what is the sort of um, lightest touch on your finger that you can detect. How light is that touch? Um, and does that differ between autistic um, people um, and non-autistic people. And you can sort of look there at the width of what we call these things violin plots. Um, so where that distribution is wide, that means a lot of people are getting scores. And then where it's narrower, that means fewer people are getting scores. And you can see the autistic and non-autistic distributions here are pretty much overlapping. They're pretty much the same. There don't tend to be differences between autistic and non-autistic people on this kind of task, either in our data or in other people's data. However, um, if you go out into the real world and you ask people or their parents to report about the sorts of sensory experiences and behaviors that they are having and um, showing, suddenly you start to see very large differences in the stimuli that people are noticing. Like here, those are uh, data of parent report of enhanced perception, picking up things that other people are missing, noticing things other people are missing on the sensory experiences questionnaire. And there you see whoppingly big group differences, the autistic people in red are picking up a lot more of those things. And, you know, when you think about real world environments, you know, there's a lot more going on. I don't know for the people at home, you know, what is going on for you, um, what um, is going on in your environment right now. But for those of us in person, you know, you could be, um, you know, looking at me and listening to me. You could be looking at the captions. You could be looking at the sign interpreting. You could be looking at other people in front of you moving around. You could be looking at the lights. You know, you could be listening to the sounds of like, I don't know if it was like, the uh, HVAC or if somebody was like rolling around something, it kind of sounded earlier today like somebody was rolling around something upstairs, it was kind of distracting, you know, all these things. And that's just in this room, which is a relatively controlled environment. If you like go outside onto the street, wow, what a diversity of sensory stimuli. So when you can have a lot of different things competing for your attention, you know, maybe that is underlying some of these experiences. Um, 
uh, you know, maybe a lot of it is having to do with the way we allocate attention to different sensory stimuli. And we've already heard from Nicole's talk right before me that there are some links to attention already. Um, and we know, of course, that there's a lot of attention differences in autism and other kinds of neurodivergence and various different theories for explaining those, one of which is the monotropism theory, which was actually proposed by autistic people, somewhat unusually for an autism theory. Um, it has only sort of recently started to get a lot of attention from non-autistic people, but for many autistic people, um, it has been a really solid explanation of a lot of our experiences, um, you know, and it's really thinking about um, attention in autism as being sort of driven by, you know, these intense um, interests and us sort of directing our attention in almost kind of like a, a tunnel where they're hyper-focusing on some things and then things that are falling outside of that interest-driven attention tunnel are sort of getting missed. Um, and so that manifests, of course, in things like intense interest interests, like Patrick's intense interest in autism research, um, or, you know, interest in sensory properties of objects, or, you know, difficulty sort of disengaging attention, difficulty, you know, moving from one thing to another once you're already on something, having difficulty moving to something else, you know, often called autistic inertia um, by autistic adults. So that's all, you know, hyper-focus, but that's not the only kind of attention difference that we see in autism. We also see more attention capture and distractibility and inattention, which sounds very paradoxical um, that we're seeing both that and hyperfocus. But we do see it, you know, in studies where there are sort of background stimuli that are capturing people's attention in ways that can often sort of interfere with people's ability to do stuff. Um, so, you know, what is going on there? Well, you know, it seems like the attention capture and the distractibility might go with hyperfocus in. More than just autism, we also see those that combination in ADHD. You know, maybe this is just sort of a common sort of atypical regulation of attention, and maybe this is related to a lot of our sensory experiences. You know, if we have this sort of um, a style of attending to the world around us and experiencing the world around us, where we are you know, having hyper-focused attention that can be captured by annoying stimuli like the sound that sounds like something rolling around above us that just started. Um, and, you know, if you're then having difficulty disengaging from that stimulus, well, if it turns out that it's um, a stimulus that might actually be distressing, that might actually be causing uh, discomfort, um, that could be an, then an extremely unpleasant experience that you're having difficulty disengaging from. So, you know, one way that we um, looked at this is using um, eye tracking in young kids, two, three, four-year-olds. Um, so we have um, this device here, which shines an infrared light at your eyes, um, and then it can look at the reflection of that light in your eyes and tell basically where you are looking on a screen. And um, this is a kind of task that is used very commonly in autism research. Um, you've got a thing that appears in the center of the screen, um, and then sometimes that thing goes away and a new thing appears on the side and people can go straight off to that new thing. Um, they don't have to disengage their attention from anything. They can go straight over. However, sometimes that thing that's in the center of the screen stays up the whole time. And then when this new thing appears off to the side of the screen, you have to disengage your attention from the thing that you're already looking at in the center of the screen before you can get over to the side of the screen, which theoretically should slow you down some. And the question is, you know, how much does that slow you down? And, you know, does that differ between autistic and non-autistic people? And is that related to the sorts of sensory experiences that these young autistic kids are having? Um, so here you can see um, the group differences, or rather the lack thereof, in this specific study. Um, so this black line, that would be no differences between when the central thing stays uh, versus goes away. Um, but then a positive score here, that means that you are slowed down. It's taking you longer to get over to this thing on the side when you have to disengage your attention from the central thing first. Um, and, you know, the distributions here of the autistic and typically developing people, they're both a bit slowed down but they don't really seem to be different in how much they're slowed down, which is somewhat different from prior autism research where you can see differences between autistic and non-autistic people. Um, but what was really interesting in our data were the relationships to the sensory experiences, which um, again, in this study, we also used that sensory experiences questionnaire that the parents were filling out about the behaviors of these um, children that we thought might be related to sensory processing. 
hand. Um, you can see here these diagonal lines in the autistic people, those uh, red people, um, when somebody has you know higher sensory scores, when they're having more of the sensory experience, um, they are slower to disengage their attention. They're having that sort of positive score that means a lag due to having to disengage their attention. And we're seeing this for all different kinds of sensory experiences. We're seeing that sort of diagonal slope as one increases the other there tends to increase as well. Um, you know, as Nicole was saying, the hyper-responsiveness and the hypo-responsiveness, though they might seem like opposites, they actually run together. And if you're slow to disengage your attention, you're having more hyper-responsiveness and you're also having more hypo-responsiveness in our data, which kind of makes sense. You know, if you have um, attention driving this and attention is a finite resource and you're paying more attention to some things, maybe you're hyper-responsive to some of those. And then that means you're paying less attention to other things and maybe you're hyper responsive to some of those, theoretically. Uh, and you're also seeing relationships to sort of sensory interests and sensory seeking behaviors, you know, seeking out sensory stimulation. Um, and that, again, that enhanced perception, noticing things that other people are not noticing. <coughs> Um, all related here to the speed at which people were disengaging their attention from things and moving on to other th things. Um, now, that is all data from these young kids. We can't ask them, um, as you know, the question was asked earlier, we can't ask them about their own sensory experiences, and so we're relying entirely on um, the report of the um, parent um, behaviors, which is somewhat um, inadequate. You know, I, I, I think Kenzie mentioned something about this earlier, that you know, how things look to other people can be very, very different from how they are experienced. And there are many autistic people, for example, who will say, Say, well, I'm shutting down and it seems like I might be hypo-responsive to this sort of sensory event, but actually, you know, I am internally in a state of overload. It's just my external bodily reaction that looks like I'm shutting down. Um, but we can ask these adults um, who are self-reporting, you know, about their own sensory experiences, and that is what we did in this big online data set that's not only including autistic people, but also ADHD people. And we're asking them about, oop, the thought there was, oh, maybe I took that out. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I did take that out. Um, sorry, I am very disorganized. Um, yes. So we asked them about their hyper-focus um, experiences. Um, so um, here's a sample item. You know, when I'm you know very focused on something, something that you know I find enjoyable or engaging. You know, I am not noticing things in the world around me, um, and I won't realize if somebody calls my name or my phone buzzes. You know, there's a lot of items similar to that on this measure. Um, and you see here um, our ADHD participants. That sort of yellow group, the purple combined autism ADHD, and then here's the autistic uh, only people, and then here are the comparison participants in blue. And you can see that comparison group, that is getting wide. Most of the people are scoring at a low level of hyperfocus, whereas our neurodivergent groups are having a lot more hyperfocus. Um, so that is tending to be very consistent with the idea that, yeah, hyperfocus seems to be an important part of the neurodivergent experience. And then there's the question of the sensory differences. So here, um, again, to Nicole's point that there's a lot of complexity to the sensory experience. Um, and as Kelsey was saying earlier, you know, a lot of different sensors, sensory modalities. Here we are just looking within one of those, the auditory one, which is often associated with the most sensory distress and impairment. Um, and even just within that single auditory modality, there's actually a lot of different kinds of sensory experience that we can unpack. But right away, Way, right off the bat, you can see here our comparison participants. Their distributions are really, you know, right around the bottom there. They are not reporting very high scores on this measure, which was actually developed by Zach Williams, the brilliant um, autistic graduate student of tomorrow's keynote speaker. Um, this, um, the, you know, they are not getting high scores on this measure, whereas our neurodivergent participants, they're reporting more of all of these different sensory patterns. And what sensory patterns might those be? Well, one of them is misophonia. Um, 
So um, misophonia, you know, is interesting because, you know, it's really an emotional reaction to a very specific sort of sensory trigger. You know, often that is, for example, chewing, you know, that's sort of the classic example, but really it could be anything that, you know, is sort of re often very repetitive, often quite obnoxious and tending to elicit emotional reactions of like anger and frustration, even rage sometimes, sometimes disgust, you know, very things. Um, and the um, misophonic trigger does not have to necessarily be loud. You know, if you are able to hear that sound and identify it, that may very well be enough to elicit that intense emotional reaction. And unfortunately, I don't think this is very well understood. It seems to be especially common for people to sort of not get believed about this, for there to be a lot of gaslighting about it. Be people just sort of saying, well, all of us find those sounds annoying, but they're missing the fact that there is a big difference in the degree to which people are emotionally reactive to these sounds. Um, and um, that is very different from, you know, another sort of sensory pattern, which could be, you know, one of being overwhelmed by really loud sounds or a bunch of different sounds bombarding you at once, you know, where it is really about the amount of sensory stimulation that's driving that and the amount of sensory stimulation is so great that it's sort of overwhelming you and making it sort of difficult to function and cope and think straight in that moment. And that's leading to that reaction of loudness overwhelm, which um, on this measure was very tightly tied to um, fear panic reactions. And, you know, to what Connor was saying earlier, you know, this fear panic reaction, this is a reaction to the sensory um, event as it is happening. It is causing you to sort of panic. But there's also another dimension on this measure, which was the anxiety avoidance dimension. So that is the anticipatory one, again, to what Connor was saying earlier, where, you know, you um, know that there's sensory stimuli that are possible and you are, even if they're not already happening, you are in a state of anxious dread that they might be, you're, you know, trying to avoid that, you know, that is the anxiety aspect. And all of that is distinct from, you know, another um, thing which we actually captured using a slightly different measure from the same person, which is this auditory distractibility point. So here, you know, these are stimuli that are not necessarily um, distressing, but they're making it very difficult to focus because they are happening in the background and your attention is being grabbed by them. Um, or at least I think that that might be the case. You know, is it the case that it is in fact attention that's driving these experiences? Well, we have um, the data there to look at that. So this is a very complex slide, but here again, you've got our five sensory patterns, one, two, three, four, five. And then for each of those, you've got two graphs. One of them is the relationship to hyperfocus, and one of them is the relationship to inattention, as in like inattention ADHD symptoms. Um, and the question is, as people's scores on the attention measure increases, they have more of the attention difference, more hyperfocus, more inattention, do they have more of the sensory experience as well? And you would see a pointy diagonal line like so um, if they do. And you are seeing there are a lot of those diagonal lines. Not everything is um, significant here, but there are a lot of cases where, yes, people are showing more of the hyperfocus. They are also showing more of those sorts of atypical and often distressing um, and impactful sensory experiences, which I think is, is really you know, consistent with this idea that the attention is you know, central to to a lot of these um, experiences. The other thing that we can, you know, look at and see relationships with um, is the anxiety um, piece. So here you have um, a, me you know, a measure of anxiety where people are just sort of rating like overall how much anxiety they experience and how much does that impact their life. Um, it's called the overall anxiety, severity, and impairment scale, um, if you care about that. Um, and then here is a measure of hypervigilance. Um, and so that is sort of um, whether as you're going about your day, you're spending all your time scanning for potential threats, things that could be threatening to you. Um, and we are seeing, again, those nice uh, or rather bad um, point, you know, diagonal line showing that as you have more of the hypervigilance and more of the anxiety, you are also having more of that sort of sensory experience. Now, this was all from a single time point. So I want to be clear, I cannot say from these data which is causing which. But speaking from my own experiences as an autistic individual, as well as what I've seen in other research and blah, 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 um, I do have an interpretation. Um, so when I was younger and, uh, you know, in middle school and the sensory um, experience 
you know, stimuli that I was exposed to um, were, you know, often very overwhelming and I had limited control over them. Um, I was becoming very anxious because I knew I was having these unpleasant experiences. Of course, those unpleasant experiences are likely to recur. So why wouldn't I be anxious? And if I'm anxious about it, I'm also going to be somewhat hypervigilant because I know that there's a threat coming. So I'm going to be scanning my environment for potential threats. But if I can't actually do anything when I spot that threat, if I'm just paying a lot of attention to something that is causing me distress, then that is going to make that experience worse. And then as that sensory experience is worse, we get this vicious feedback loop where I have more anxiety and more hypervigilance and I'm getting exhausted and burnt out and overwhelmed, which diminishes my coping energy and yada, yada, yada. And it just becomes, you know, a bad, bad spiral. The good side is when I got out of, you know, that situation where I was constantly being exposed to these distressing sensory stimuli, um, things got better. You know, I was now able to cope with the sensory stimuli a lot better. My anxiety went away. The hypervigilance greatly reduced. So, you know, it, it is, I think, you know, a sort of bi-directional thing that can be either a virtuous or a vicious cycle. Again, that's just my interpretation. It's all from a single time point. I have no data to drive that. Um, but that is pretty much all the data that I had to show you today. So I thought I might just end by, you know, giving some more of my sort of random interpretations and thoughts, um, speaking sort of in my autistic person um, hat. Um, do you know the thing that I say there? This is not clinical advice. I'm not a clinician. I'm just like a developmental psychology PhD candidate. Um, these are just my personal opinions, yada, yada, yada. Um, that being said, um, I have talked about how I think a lot of the sensory experiences are related to attention, but I want to be very clear about something that that doesn't mean that they're not real or that they're all in people's um, heads or, or whatever. Um, it is very difficult to control your attention sometimes with wheeled power alone. If I give you, for example, the challenge of not thinking about a pink elephant right now, will I show you a picture of a pink elephant and say the word pink elephant all the time? Are you going to be able to avoid thinking about a pink elephant right now? Is there anybody who is not thinking at some level about a pink elephant while I'm saying pink elephant, pink elephant? pink elephant pink elephant pink elephant no I'm not seeing any hands so I'm concluding that people are thinking about pink elephants um, yeah um, these attentional patterns may be attentional but that doesn't mean that they're voluntary um, I do not understand why so many people refuse to accept the validity of these sensory experiences well I do but because um, uh, you're not having them yourself necessarily but you know it doesn't take a lot of empathy to understand I think that um, if somebody is having distress if they are being harmed by something if they are in a state of distress they do not want to be in that state of distress and if there was something that they could already be doing to cope with that situation they would be doing so. So, you know, give them some empathy, give them a break, validate their experiences. They need that. Um, you know, they need to be believed and have that accepted. Um, the other thing too is I want to be clear, you know, I'm saying that this is in large part about attention. That doesn't mean it's all attention. Um, you know, I actually think there's a lot of neurodivergent sensory experiences that probably can't be explained by attention alone. Um, like for example, some people report experiencing, you know, physical pain caused by sounds that are not sort of loud enough that they would ordinarily evoke physical pain. And, you know, this is a tricky point because a lot of neurodivergent people will say the sound is painful because we don't have words to express that it's extremely distressing and like pain um, without using the metaphor of pain because the English language was written and designed by neurotypicals to express neurotypical experiences and not autistic ones. Um, but there are people who are very clear that no, they're not just using this metaphorically to convey extreme distress. It is actual physical pain that is caused by no sounds that are not loud. And I do not see a, a sort of compelling way that attention alone can explain that. That's got to be something else. Um, same for tinnitus. Uh, you know, that sensation of ringing in your ears that is not sort of caused by something that's ringing in your environment, that's internally generated. That seems to be more common in neurodivergent people. There's some preliminary evidence of that. And um, I, again, do not see how that could be caused by attention. So there are clearly other things going on, and I don't want to uh, ignore that, but I do think the attention plays a large role, personally. Um, and so you could ask, you know, okay, well, even if we're not sort of blaming the person for not being able to reorient their attention, is there some way we could help them do that? Um, 
maybe you know there there is like one study um of misophonia um, intervention that was saying that participants found it helpful to get some attention reorientation training and you know i know in my own life i can sometimes find it really helpful if i'm in a sensory environment and i don't have to pay attention to what's going on in that environment you know and i have some like a device i can whip out and you know i can do something highly engaging on that device you know that makes it much easier to tolerate that environment because now i'm engaged with my thing on my device and i don't have to be engaged with the world around me as much. It helps. Um, doesn't solve it entirely, but it, it can help. But if I have to be paying attention to the environment around me, then obviously whipping out a device and reorienting my attention to what's going on in the device is not going to be helpful. So it's a very limited solution. Um, I think you know it may actually be more uh, impactful that you know having a better understanding of your sensory experiences, the role that attention may or may not play in those experiences, having the terminology and concepts to articulate different sensory experiences, even within the auditory modality, like the distinction between misophonia, for example, and that overwhelm reaction, let alone everything that's happening outside auditory processing. You know, I think that give, can give us more of a sense of um, control, um, that we understand our own sensory experiences, we understand what's going on, we have some level of control because of that understanding and we can advocate for our needs. That is my real hope with this sort of research. And a few final, final take home thoughts. Um, I have a bit of a rant about flexibility. Because we as autistic people are always accused of being inflexible. We are seen as rigid. And yeah, okay, yeah, we can be stubborn. I get, I get it. That being said, neurotypical society is extremely rigid and inflexible. And we are constantly having to accommodate to neurotypical society and its demands. And there are often very simple things that can be done to avoid exposing somebody to distressing sensory stimulus. Like for example, Terry Fox runs. You know, when I was growing up um, as a young autistic person in BC, um, I was constantly being exposed to this overwhelmingly loud, noisy music that the neurotypical school staff thought was a great thing to play during Terry Fox runs um, because that was, you know, apparently enjoyed by some of the neurotypical students. And even if that's true, that is not an excuse for causing distress and harm to the people like me that is causing distress and harm to. So be flexible, you know. Um, if there is a simple, easy way that you can change the environment, do so. And allow escape. You know, if somebody is in a state where they are overloaded, uh, then, you know, there is no purpose served by keeping that person in the environment that is overloading them. You know, allow them to get out of that environment and, you know, um, somewhere where they can recover. Um, because if they are in a state of sensory overload, they are not getting anything out of that environment. There is just no purpose served by leaving them there at that point. And the only thing that it can lead to is something bad. And of course, technology. You know, um, a couple of weeks ago, I was at a conference, a different conference, and um, you know, there was a bit of an audio issue this morning um, during the Q and A session after the keynote with an annoying noise that appeared sometimes um, in um, the microphone. And um, you know, um, in this other thing, like it was similar but way higher pitched. It was really, really annoying, and it was coming in and out for the entire duration. Of of the symposium session of talks. It was awful. And I fortunately had my noise canceling headphones, so I just whipped them out, put them on. I was able to listen to all the talks and hear the person speaking, and I did not hear any of this ultra high pitched, um, high frequency whine that was in the audio system. Uh, it was great. Thank you, noise canceling headphones. So yes, technological solutions, they're great. Um, and my final thought here, I probably don't actually have to say it because I think it's been largely anticipated by Kenzie and Kelsey and Connor earlier. I was just going to say that um, yes, you know, the ex in my, again, humble opinion as a non-clinician, the exposure um, method, you know, if somebody is sort of autonomously um, choosing to be there and if you're gradually exposing them to something, that can be great for something that is not inherently a sensory aversion, um, something that it's really like a more emotional thing, an interpretation of the situation that can be changed. But if something is inherently aversive, you know, building up a tolerance to that, you know, is going to backfire because you're just going to get into that vicious cycle that I mentioned where exposing somebody to something that's inherently aversive leads to anxiety and just makes everything worse.
And that's all I had to say today, other than, you know, thank you to this, um, all the people who collaborated in this research, you know, a huge um, uh, team of people, um, as well as the funders of the research, and of course, all of the people who participated in this research, as well as the family members um, who were um, also involved in the research. And thank you all. Thank you, Patrick. We've got some questions. Um, ironically, one of them came in after this morning's presentation, before you spoke, um, but it actually relates, um, I think, in my humble opinion, um, thinking about reorienting and the attention piece. And so um, our artistic four-year-old daughter is very sensory sensitive to most things, but with toothpaste, we have tried every flavor, even unflavored, but she still struggles with it every day. She says she can taste it, it tastes gross, but it has no flavor. Mm. She also doesn't like textures and complains about that in all toothpaste types. Any advice? It is truly very painful for her. Yeah, that is a, a good question. And, you know, I, I mean, I really hesitate to say because, I mean, I don't um, know the, you or your situation. I mean, I wonder... Um, it sounds like this is somebody who seems to be very um, verbal for that age. Um, I don't know if it is the texture that they're picking up. I mean, some of these things, there is like a slight burn to them as well, that maybe that's um, it. Maybe that's what's going on in, in the mouth. I mean, uh, ideally, of course, one would like to um, be able to do things in a way that you are allowing people autonomy, but of course, you know, if it's something where it's about their safety or their health, that does make it a tricky thing. So, you know, I just wonder if there's some way of negotiating and offering, like, choices, like, not of toothbrushing or no toothbrushing, but different ways of going about the toothbrushing. Um, uh, you know, um, and uh, negotiations uh, that could, um, you know, allow the person some element of control in that situation. I'm sorry, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know what else to say there. Thanks. Do you have baking soda? Baking soda. I've used baking soda in a pinch before, I have to say, and it does a great job. I found... Um, at Lush, L-U-S-H, they have chewable tablet-like ones that are not like toothpaste, but uh, a powdery one, so yes, something to try. Uh, so the answer, if you were clear, um, Lush. Uh, so it's like a tablet, is that what you said? It's like a powder. So something to consider. Thank you. Another question, Patrick, did you find ability to attend and less sensory sensitivities changing as a person as you have grown older? Um, also relating to um, executive functioning and changes in that over time. Possibly, yeah. I mean, I've definitely seen my sensory experiences change over time. I think the biggest chunk of that has probably been more in the environments I'm in and the amount of control that I have over them. There has sort of been a sort of general trajectory in my life where, you know, up until sort of middle school, I was in um, increasingly distressing sensory environments, increasingly overwhelming sensory environments with a relatively constant level of control over them. Uh, but then I started homeschooling like distance education through sides, if you know sides, um, and uh, then, you know, through um, like my undergraduate and graduate studies getting, you know, I have had a much higher level of, contr of control over my sensory environment, which has tended to involve less overwhelming sensory stimulation to start with. Um, and, you know, being in academia now um, as a PhD candidate, you know, I have a, a very high degree of control over the sensory environments that I'm in, and they're not very overwhelming to start with. So um, as a result of that, you know, I feel like that high level of control that I have, as well as the generally low level ex exposure to sensory stimuli, I'm not spending a great deal of time in any sort of anxiety or dread about the sensory experiences. So I'm, I'm very well able to cope with them when they occur. Um, whether there's, you know, some sort of maturational or executive functioning component, I, 
Um, do you think that it, it's probably likely that there is? But, you know, in my own experience, the environmental piece and the amount of control over the environment is so big that it sort of dwarfs um, anything else uh, that, to the point that I, I can't necessarily pick that out in a clear way in terms of my own experience. Thank you. What brand of noise cancelling headphones do you use is a question. Um, so my uh, usual go-to ones are the Bose noise cancelling headphones. Those are uh, just, just really overall great. Um, there are, you know, um, some other ones, and I don't know the brands offhand I use for more specific purposes, like I have um, so a set of earbuds for uh, listening to, um, uh, you, you know, the uh, plane videos, because I do a lot of plane travel, um, and, and those, they just, you know, they, they're wired, they just plug into the thing, and they're noise-canceling earbuds. They're, they're not very expensive, but the noise cancellation is good enough that, um, you know, uh, combined with the noise of the movie on the plane, it, it, it helps. Um, and I have a couple of other less effective noise cancelling headphones that I use just because of the tactile feel of them, but, but the Bose ones are the main ones. Thank you. And the last uh, couple of comments. Oh, Connor, sorry, go ahead first. Um, fantastic presentation. I have so many questions. <laughs> I'm going to try and limit it to one. Um, so you had four groups in a lot of the studies, ADHD, ADHD plus autism, autism only, and none of those things. Um, and I was just noticing on your graphs, a lot of the time the ADHD only group looked very similar to autism and ADHD, more so than the autism only group. So there was actually a lot of grouping around ADHD in terms of what you were displaying as opposed to autism. And I was just wondering if those are, sig like what are you seeing in terms of group differences and if you could comment on that at all. Yeah, it's, that is something that really interested and somewhat surprised us as well. So uh, yeah, um, uh, so this is, that was an online study. So um, we, I do have to say we're somewhat limited in terms of what we can do as far as diagnostic verification. I'm very much uh, of the, well, you know, the self-identifications are, are usually valid school, but when it comes to differential diagnosis, of course, that becomes much trickier because people may just genuinely not know um, that they could, you know, fit into these other boxes as well. Um, so... Um, we did have like an ADHD um, screening measure, the ASRS, and an autism screening measure, um, the uh, RADS-14, the brief one, um, and um, those were somewhat limited. In fact, we actually saw that uh, so many of the ADHD people had high RADS scores that we couldn't actually kick them out of the study, which was the same in the original RADS-14 validation sample, actually. Um, uh, so there's somewhat of a limit to, you know, I'm sure that there's people who got into the different groups who should not have been there. That being said, we did see very clearly that, you know, the um, autistic um, groups with and without ADHD had a very high level of autistic um, traits. Um, the ADHD only people had less so in the comparison folks less so than that. Very robust group differences, big separation between the groups, and sort of the same thing for the ADHD traits, except, you know, reversed with autism and ADHD, of course. Um, and so uh, given that, you you know, background, yeah, we were surprised that um, the ADHD people were having, you know, so many of these sensory experiences. Yes, there were a few more sensory experiences in the autistic people sometimes uh, for some of the sensory experiences, but for others, and I think misophonia especially, you know, were at least, you know, just as, as common in the ADHD folks, um, I think. Um, I have to go back there to, to make 100% sure of, oh, overshot, um, but, uh, but yeah. Um, not not necessarily I mean uh, for example you know um, it look you know here you know the it looks like the autistic folks uh, are, are higher than the ADHD folks where they where the ADHD folks were higher was on hyperfocus which I think might just be the measure here which you know it's very interesting you know the hyperfocus you'd think it's the same as flow it's actually not. Um, in fact, um, a different study has found that hyperfocus and flow are inversely related. Um, so I think there's some conceptual construct issues here. We did see in our sample that the autistic people had um, the most intense interest, not significantly different from the ADHD group, but they were the only ones to sort of differ from the control group. So um, it's, it's very complicated and, and messy. And again, I, you know, I'm, I'm not swearing to like everybody being in their correct assigned group. But yeah, it does seem like the level of 
uh, certain sensory issues is, is, you know, like the misophonia, for example, not differing between um, the autistic and ADHD people. Um, I didn't necessarily expect that. I expected the autistic people would have more of the sensory issues relative to the ADHD folks than actually turned out to be the case. But, you know, I do know ADHD people who uh, are not autistic who have a lot of these sensory experiences, so it, it, maybe it's not surprising given that. Okay. Uh, apologies if we didn't get to your question. Um, one last thing before you conclude. Um, this is a question from Tiffany Wojnarowski, who oh. will be our keynote tomorrow. She is saying, excited to see your new data, Patrick. Are your past findings for springy attention differences holding in your larger database? Um, uh so this is uh, a reference to um, uh, another aspect of the eye tracking study um, here. Um, not in addition to looking at the question of whether people are faster to um, uh, get over to that um, thing on the side after they've been at the center, we also looked at do they go back to the central location, um, you know, um, more quickly or slowly, you know, are people sort of like just orienting briefly over to the new thing and then springing right back to where they were before. And we looked at that in this study as well as in, um, you know, another task that was done by the same participants that was similar enough to allow us to sort of do that. And um, I think actually um, with the current data set, um, we've got maybe a couple more people to add, so it might change again that the springy attention group difference, although it was significant in that task that I showed you, the gap overlap one, the disengagement one, I think it's no longer significant, but it still is in the other task that we showed. But again, you know, but even in the gap overlap, it's sort of hovering around the threshold. And so when I add in the few remaining people, it may change again. We'll see, I I'm hoping. Yeah.